Hi guys, <clears throat> here I am again, Gunther. Today I would like to talk to you about a real case, uh, the Hui Fong. Hui Fong case. Hui Fong <clears throat> was a um, Chinese Vietnamese uh, refugee, so to say, after the Vietnam War uh, in the late 70s, beginning 80s, uh, after the war the end of the war in Vietnam, he took a boat uh, with some other 3,000, so to say, refugees, uh, took the boat Hui Fong uh, to go to Kowloon and from there to Taiwan. So in order to flee the communist uh, takeover of Vietnam. That was, as I said, by the end of uh, 70s beginning 80s he ended up eventually in the United States in Los Angeles and there naturally in Chinatown. <clears throat> this was Mr. Tran, David Tran. Now what does he do for a living? He was an armor in, uh, a major in the army of uh, South Vietnam now uh, he was in the United States with some relatives and, well, he thought, uh, I love eating, I know the recipe of Sri Racha. Sri Racha is a town in Thailand which is known for a kind of sauce, hot, so um, spicy uh, sauce, uh, which is made there and he loved it uh, in his own kitchen with his mother. Uh, so uh, he decided to make this as a business. He created therefore a small business with this uh, hot hot pepper sauce in Los Angeles. He called it Hui Fong. Hui Fong means uh, flowing together, big flowing together. So that was the uh, the uh, boat which carried him from Saigon to Kowloon, to Kowloon, to Hong Kong. So uh, he was not very inventive with that, but uh, that was his company name, Hui Fong. Now, uh, why do I, well, the label, uh, let me say the label, he uh, made the label uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a trademark uh, the label is a complex label with different languages and uh, different um, ornamental elements. Uh, it has displayed a rooster in the middle, in a prominent place, uh, and therefore often it is uh, recalled as the rooster sauce in the United States. And the bottle is a squeeze bottle, so you have to put it on the, on the bottom, which is very current now. The squeeze bottle uh, of plastic and with a, a green cap, he invented, so to say, he put a green cap on it uh, in order to give some freshness uh, to the bottle. Now, he had some uh, success on the US market, but why I'm telling you this together with IP? Well, uh, it is a kind of efficient use of intellectual property. I scared you perhaps a bit with the last video on the cost of IP. So he took an advantage of very, in an efficient way. He used it in a very efficient way and I'll tell you why. So he has a trademark with the label. As I said, it's a complex label. I would like to show it here, but uh, it is not possible due to technical reasons. I'm not uh, very versatile with it. So you, uh, it's a complex label on a red bottle and a green cap. So the label is protected and the bottle with a cap is as well, with a green cap is as well protected either as a design or as a trademark. I suppose as a trademark because trademark has a longer uh, life not an expiry date as the design has. So he took quite a cheap approach with regard to IP. Now there are, uh, with the success coming some uh, competition uh, to the market, 
and he uh, saw that giants, food giants, American food giants like Heinz, uh, like Taco Bell, uh, like Kraft, or others, they came on the market also with uh, these kind of bottles and these kind of hot uh, sauces and they named it Sri Racha as well, Sri Racha, as you recall, the name of the town in Thailand, where it comes from, where it originated, right? So what was his uh, IP strategy with regard to these uh, giants? Well, rather than enforcing its right against similar bottles or against uh, the squeezing issue or against the naming of the Sri Racha, uh, well, he thought, I will compete with price and quality. You know, the bottle is not more than $3 in today's prices. He started this in the 80s, so it was probably cheaper by then. But still, today prices, $3 is not something uh, which stands out for a good quality product and uh, he competes with price and product. By the way, he had never a marketing uh, department or so. Uh, so he thought, well, if the big players are on this market, they are playing my game. Uh, I have a good price and I have a good quality. And in order to beat this, well, that would be very difficult for them. So at the end, uh, the marketing efforts of the others will play out a good game for himself. And I think uh, the move was rather smart due to the uh, low price and he never uh, got to that uh, very high premium level which we can see on the market for other brands. Uh, I will come to an example right now. Uh, so he uh, thought that on price and on quality I think uh, they can not much do about it and he continued uh, to have success although his margin are rather reduced. Now I uh, wanted to come to an example uh, which is on uh, recently I came across uh, which is a flip-flop. So flip-flops are a cheap product, right? Uh, it is made often in China, but uh, they are used in order to, by the luxury markets or by the brands, the big brands, so to say, in order to take some uh, premium money and convey to the people some kind of uh, glamour or, or high quality. So the flip-flops, uh, where uh, there were two pictures, uh, one was Nike, all of them were black. Nike was with uh, $25 and Alexander McQueen had one with $425. What? <laughs> yes, you heard right. $425 was the flip-flop of Alexander McQueen. So I don't know exactly what are the sales figures for Alexander McQueen? I would say they would be rather poor. You can have a premium price for a, a, branded, a branded good because the customers which whom you have built a kind of reputation and, and trust relationship uh, they say, well, I buy this, I buy more, but I buy quality. I don't buy substandard products. But when I uh, refer to premium prices, I will not say that you can, uh, you can charge the customer uh, thousands percent of more of what would be a comparable quality uh, with regard to the competition. So don't, don't do that. And here we have just the contrary. We have a brand and we have somebody who has not charged a premium price, so to say, or just a little, uh, with regard to the quality and the competition and, and other products within the market, with, uh, which are rather generic than, uh, than anything else. So uh, he did not care about much uh, the competition, but continued to growth its product competing on price and quality. 
Now, at a certain moment, uh, that guy received a complaint from customers around the US, so he's in Los Angeles, and the complaint was from Boston or from the East Coast somewhere, uh, about substandard quality, so uh, they, he was accused of watering down the sauce, and uh, this is not the same quality, and he didn't do anything, anything different uh, than he did the 20 years before, so he asked uh, to bring over the, uh, the goods uh, in order to inspect them, what, what happened there. And once he got uh, the products uh, from that uh, annoyed customer, uh, he analyzed the product and it, uh, it was uh, the case that the bottle was very similar, uh, but uh, it was a fake product. So even for a $3 product, a $3 product in the US, you may encounter uh, counterfeiters in order to uh, reap some uh, profits on the coattail of a successful business owner. So he tried to uh, solve the issue suing the, uh, the uh, distributor uh, where he received from uh, the owners and uh, well they said well I didn't know I had no idea that this was a uh, fake product so uh, we thought it was just a normal price and uh, you know you wouldn't expect that a fake product would be done for this three dollar one now how does how did this uh, played out at a certain moment he got a call in Los Angeles from uh, police by saying please uh, would you uh, take back uh, some packages uh, of yours which are on the parking lot since uh, four or five days and uh, well uh, he he didn't uh, have something on the parking lot but uh, the policy insisted well that is your uh, your indication on the uh, on the outside here and therefore I'm uh, phoning you so he sent a employee over to the parking lot and uh, what he found was uh, a pallet of uh, goods from the outside, the cartons, uh, the packages used by Hui Fong uh, was exactly the same. And once you open it, uh, you got in the inside a uh, Chinese uh, uh, Chinese carton uh, with, uh, with with other indications, etc. And in the inside, there were in fact the fake product which were done uh, by the, the counterfeiter. And at a certain moment, uh, well, some, they said, we place it there and we will just uh, look at it together with the police. At a certain moment, uh, somebody came and uh, wanted to, uh, uh, to uh, dispose of uh, this uh, container and then uh, they uh, draw back through this channel in order to come uh, to the real counterfeiter. So uh, what would be the uh, lesson here around? One would be a very efficient on uh, efficiency uh, IP management, uh, but on the base of uh, taking only what would be the trademark, the patent is the, would be the most, exam, most, uh, most uh, the difficult example. It could have been on the formula, perhaps a trade secret would be possible if the formula was a kind of secret with regard uh, to the uh, mixture, a combination uh, of the ingredients. But <clears throat> in the meantime, he had some 55 uh, employees, so a trade secret is not easy uh, to be taken. And the other is, it did it probably on the expense of uh, some profit margin. So he keep the price down in order not to uh, high, to take um, uh, high profit from the consumers due to its reputation. So thank you for tuning in. That was it uh, for today. See you next time on Enforcement.